All righty, beautiful people. We are live now. Um, I want to first and foremost just uh, welcome you all. I know some of you are in our Facebook group, Mobile Home Investing for Newbies. Uh, this is really just a place for um, you guys to come, to learn, to just get information that you can apply in mobile homes, right? So for those who know, I'm Jasmine Gittins. I have been involved, haven't been involved in mobile homes for that long. In love with it and like, you know, talking about it all the time. Started with single families for over five, almost five years, um, investing in single families, uh, wholesaling single families. Um, got introduced to mobile homes and took, you know, just did a couple deals. And I was like, oh, wow, like such a huge difference um, in the speed of the transactions, in the quality of the transactions, in the quantity of the transactions. It just was a, was a lot. So um, I actually just shared a post, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, um, just kind of like a January update that we, you know, we wholesaled six uh, mobile homes this month. Well, last month, January. Um, and this is just about our um, almost our fourth month in, you know, investing or, or yes, investing in, in mobile homes. Um, so that was just a huge deal for us. We, you know, we made a, a net profit of a little over twenty thousand um, dollars just with mobile homes. You know, we have multiple streams of, of income, but that was just a great um, start into this industry. And two people that I, I shouted out in that um, update of January was Calvin Ahia of um, Mobile Home Investing Full Time, and our very special guest today. Mark Anthony. Uh, so if you guys are not familiar, most of you probably are. Um, if you've been involved or researching uh, mobile homes in any type of way. Um, but Mark Anthony has been really, um, you know, we call him the GOAT, right? <laughs> um, because he's shared so much knowledge uh, and information um, that is so applicable and helps you really kind of broaden your perspective and on the possibilities of mobile homes. You know, you may have only thought you could only flip or only could rent, but there's so many other uh, options and opportunities. And that's one of the great things um, that Mark has brought to uh, us all as newbies or as experienced um, individuals. So, you know, I, I had to shout him out in that post and I'm grateful and, and just, you know, so excited to have him on. Um, as a special guest tonight. So I want to just formally introduce our special guest, Mark Anthony tonight. So welcome, Mark. So excited to have you on. Um, and tonight I want to just really share and talk about, you know, your journey from starting in mobile homes to now owning your own mobile home manufacturing company, which is just a huge, 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 um, you know, Su success. I mean, that's just, that's huge, you know? So um, I want to just first, you know, allow yourself to uh, introduce yourself and then just tell us how did you even get into mobile homes in the first place? Yeah, so for sure. Um, so I'm Mark Anthony. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm actually from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, grew up in Boston, went to school in Boston, uh, started college in Boston, um, ended up playing football and transferred uh, to Boise State, um, ended up going to college for, uh, started with my associates in interior design, then went to construction management, got my master's, and then I was working on my, uh, I mean, my bachelor's in construction management, and then I was working on my master's in architecture, but I uh, just didn't finish it. Um, mm -hmm. Started getting into like the phase where you start looking for internships, and then looking at some of like the job opportunities after college, and found out that like architects make like 35 grand a year. And I was just like, whoa, that number doesn't seem right. <laughs> and then that there's like no architecture jobs out there because how many times do you need an architect? And then when you do need one, how many do you need? And then think of all the ones that have been out since like the 1960s and 70s that are still around mm -hmm. being architects. There's, there's not much big demand for new architects, maybe engineers, but architects, not really. So right. um, I had gotten into multi-level marketing like stuff like Herbalife and Amway and, and uh, ACN and, and and every single company out there I tried about 50 different companies products lotions potions 
<laughs> digital products, physical products, jump ropes, you name it. I tried it all. If you could sell it, I was I was hustling and slanging it on the internet. <laughs> um, and then that really just kind of like woke up my entrepreneurial mindset. I read like a lot of uh, uh, personal development books, getting into mm -hmm. MLM. They were talking about, you know, mindset, right. um, becoming financially literate, got my hands on Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that just like cracked open everything um, mm -hmm. in terms of becoming a real estate investor. I was thinking, man, I can do this entrepreneur thing, be my own boss, but then get my way back into this whole architecture Things. I've always wanted to, to build cities. I've always wanted to be uh, somehow build cities. I didn't know mm -hmm. how that would work out, but I figured architecture was the way that didn't work. So I went to real estate investing. And so I was in all these MLM companies, hoping one day I'd find a mentor who could teach me real estate investing. And I just never came across one. Mm -hmm. And then I got sick of like building these, these, these big teams, recruiting people and the company would shut down and then have to start a new company and then move everybody from that company to a new company and start <laughs> all over again. Right. And doing that just got really tiring. So um, I got into wholesaling. I started trying to get into wholesaling single family homes. And then mm -hmm. that got really competitive in like 2014, 2015 in Phoenix. Yeah. It was uh, nearly impossible. I got my hands on, on three wholesales, uh, one in Nashville, two here. And uh, I was really just, just trying to figure stuff out. I was getting into lease options at the time. I was trying to figure out how to wholesale uh, apartment complexes because in, in, in the market here in Phoenix, um, that was a really big thing. All the apartments here were built in the 70s and none of them have been renovated yet. So it was like a big mm -hmm. trend in the city and they started building new apartment complexes. Okay. Um, and then I went into a meetup that was talking about, um, well, I didn't really, it was just a real estate meetup. And so I went and they had this guest speaker and this lady was talking about how she made, it's her 18th month in the business. And she was making 60 grand a month. And, mm. and I was like, in real estate, 60 grand a month, that means you have like 60 rental homes. Right. And at the time, houses were $200,000. So I was like, you have 60, $200,000 houses. Right. You've been in this for 18 months and you did nothing before. You were a single home, stay at home mom. Like, <laughs> tell me how you did this. Like, I was, I wanted to know. Not to like judge anybody. I was like, this, this lady doesn't look like she just, you know, that's a big jump. You right. Know, that's a big jump. There's the, I didn't see a Maserati parked outside. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, was, I was hooked and she started getting in how she was a uh, seller financing mobile. Mm. Homes. And I was mm -hmm. like, Oh my God, like I can still make a thousand dollars a month renting these homes or seller financing these homes that only cost at the time, like two, three, four, five thousand $5,000. I was like, this is insane. While mm. I was sitting in the audience, I, I downloaded the let go app, the five miles app and offer up. And I started looking for mobile homes. I found one for, for $2,000 and set up an appointment, went and drove out there the next day. I gave the guy $200 down. It's what I had in my pocket that day. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you more money at the end of the week. It was like Monday or two. It was like Tuesday or Wednesday. And I was like, hey, I'll come back out here Friday because it was like 50 miles away. It was way, way on the other side of the city. And uh, the next day I found a buyer for it for $5,000. She gave me $1,500 down. I used that, paid off uh, what I owed Matt. And, you know, finance the rest. And then, you know, fast forward a um, couple months, maybe this was uh, just before Thanksgiving, fast forward to like Father's Day. Mm -hmm. And the lady had to move out. She was something going on with her kid. She had to move back to Pennsylvania. I gave her two options. You can sell it, make your money, do do whatever you do, sell you, pay, pay me off. Or you can move out and just not worry about what you owe me. Just take the money you got and your stuff and just, you know, move on to, the, to whatever you got going on next. And, I, and I'll right. take it from here. So I did that and um, I decided to remodel the home. It needed a little bit of more work. Uh, she put a little wear and tear on it. So my uh, friend actually gave me a $4,000 loan from his life insurance policy. And I used that to rehab the home and I fixed it all up and ended up selling it to a lady uh, who wanted it moved to another park for about $18,000 at the time. Wow. Uh, I knew nothing about moving homes at the time. Like our golden rule was these mobile homes don't move. Keep them exactly where they're at in the park. Right. Don't worry about moving them. And I was like, oh man, like, okay. But this lady wants this house moved. She's going to give me $18,000. I'm going to figure out how to move this house because I got a house for two grand. <laughs> I'm figure this out, right? Right. So I a bunch of people trying to figure out how to get it moved. It was impossible. Finally, I found this like uh, the super Mexican guy, like straight out of Mexico. Like, he walked over from Mexico like two weeks ago. He can't even speak yes. English, but he can drive a truck. So um, I, I tell him, hey, I was like, hey, can you move my house? And he told me it was going to take a couple months. And I was like, okay, well, if I come help you work 
and finish the other houses you have to move. That will help you finish those ones faster so you can get to mine. And then I'll know how to do mine and I'll do mine myself. Mm. All you got to do is come and just pick it up and go. So we had a deal. By the time we got to my house, like we got through his, the park had moved somebody into my house. And somebody was living. Some old lady, she came to the door and walked her in. She's shaking. She could barely stand. Looked like she was going to have a stroke. And I was like, oh, man, I can't tell this lady that this is my house. And she's got to oh go. Oh, my God. She's going to drop dead in front of me. And then I'm going to have to do <laughs> a whole new problem. Uh, so I just left it, right? I was like, I have $18,000. I can go find another house. And I'll just go find this lady another house. It's, it's no big deal. I have eighteen grand. So I found another house for six grand. Um, went to go move it out of the park. Gave the park the first one refusal. The park's like, no, we'll give you $8,000 to keep it here and i was like oh well two grand i'll i'll just go find another house <laughs> <laughs> so i went and found another house and then finally found a house that worked and we got it moved and moved it for that lady and then from there and i started moving every house from that moment on and wow. uh, you know paid off my friend that loan and then i used that to open up my own policy i was like i like that you know um because the the terms were extremely flexible he's like just pay me back whenever you want i don't even have to pay this loan back if i don't want to it won't mm. hurt me as long as I keep paying my my principal and my policy. Right. Uh, the cash value of my policy will just earn back whatever you borrowed. Um, so I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go get a policy after. So I got a policy. And then uh, I started going to auctions. There's uh, the tax delinquent auctions for people who don't pay their property taxes in Arizona. Uh, we have annual property taxes. Not every state has personal property taxes. Some only have real property taxes. So for real right. estate, not right. for personal property. So Arizona. We not only have annual property taxes, but we also have sales tax on every transaction. Some states, they only do sales tax for the initial sale from the factory to the dealer. Mm -hmm. um, some do a sales tax every sale, every transaction. So Arizona, we have both those taxes every year, every sale. So um, there was a bunch of mobile homes that would go up to auction. And at the time, the rules of the auction were uh, the opening bid would be the amount of taxes owed if nobody bid. They would cut the bid in half and open up bids at half that price. So say the opening bid was a thousand, nobody mm. bids five hundred. If nobody bids again, they drop the opening bid down to one dollar and they start bids at a dollar. Oh wow! So nobody knew about these auctions, but me and my friend Alex, we would go to the auction with ten dollars, leave with ten houses, and we would do that for a couple of years. Um, oh, wow. And then it came to the point where parks were kind of giving us a hard time because they were getting mad how we were buying these homes crazy cheap. And then since we bought these homes as a lien holder, as a tax lien, when we purchased the home, we foreclosed on it as a lien holder. And as a lien holder, you don't have a lease agreement with the park. Right. So that means we didn't have to pay them lot rent because we we're, we don't have any agreement. Mm. We buy it from the owner. If we bought it from the owner, then there'd be some type of like, oh, but the owner sold it to you. So you're kind of, you're, you're kind of, yeah, yeah. At least it kind of grandfathers over to you. But since the home was sold by the sheriff, None of those rules applied. So we weren't paying lot rent until the homes got sold and there was nothing the parks could do by what? law. Wow. And we were mad. So it came to a point where they weren't letting anybody get approved for our homes until we paid the back rent. Oh, and wow. I was like, well, we can't pay the back rent until you approve these people. And then they give us the check. And then when they give us the check, then we can pay for it. It's yeah. kind of how this thing works. People mm -hmm. when they were saying, oh, we don't care, pay us now, or we won't approve anybody. So we're like, all right, well, we'll just move these homes out. So then it came to a point where we started realizing wow. all these Mexican families here in Arizona, you know, Mexicans, we all know they all live together in the same house and share the same car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do that to save their money. They stack up their cash and then they go buy a house in cash. They go buy cars in cash. So we realized all these people were buying land and then having, uh, then buying these houses and having this move these homes to their land. Um, so after like a hundred of those, we're like, man, we got to start getting our own land and just do it ourselves and then sell it to them. Um, so then we started doing that. Um, and then we started going to the eviction auctions when people would get evicted from their not paying lot rent. Um, and then, you know, we would kind of help out the parks because they would their eviction process would be like a three month process by the time it would take them to get somebody out to have somebody else in again for the rent to start turning on again. Because mm. they gotta give like the 30 day notice. And then from the 30 day notice, they got to go to the court and then the court's got to give their like nine day thing plus like time to move out. And then if the person wants, they can squat for like 30 days without getting any legal trouble. And then um, once that's done, then the park has to post the a lien on the property for the back rent, a lien on the title, and then, you know, auction off that lien. And then they got to wait for the 30-day notice for the auction and then hold the auction. 
and then they got to wait for the new title once the person buys it from the auction. Yeah. So it's like a 60, I mean, a a six-month process when parks have to evict somebody by the time the person stops paying rent to when rent starts rolling again. Hmm. And when lot rents like $6,000 a year, it's $3,000 a home. But the parks lose. So we were saying, so we would go to parks and say, hey, if you got any evictions, let us know. We'll buy them from these people, stop them from going to eviction, give them money to move out. Um, and then, you know, get the money to move out, stop their eviction. So they don't have an eviction on their record. They can just go and get somewhere else Yep. and then get somebody in here by the end of the month. And now in like 30 days, we get rent rolling again instead of six months. Oh my um, goodness. If we kept the homes in the parks, we wouldn't. Uh, so then the parks started getting kind of mad, but <laughs> Uh, it's just the people who wanted to move would were willing to pay a lot more and they were willing to pay cash. The people who wanted them in the parks wanted to finance them. And they were like, Nothing. yeah, we can't, we can't finance them. Cause we started financing a few at first. Well, more than a few, like 83 of them. And we didn't have a MLO license. We didn't mm-hmm. have an originator license. And, and we ended up trying to go get a business loan to start buying some equipment to move more homes. Like, uh, um, uh, you know, like the platypuses and, and we tried to buy some more trucks. Right. And we're trying to get a loan and the bank's like, okay, cool. What type of collateral do you have? What type of assets? And we're like, oh, we have all these mobile home notes that people are paying. And they're, they're like, okay, these are great. The numbers look great. But where's the license number on here? And we're like, oh, we're not licensed dealers. Uh, you're like, no, you don't need to be a licensed dealer. Where's your mortgage originator? Where's your Where's your mortgage license? These are mortgages. And we're like, oh, we thought we only needed a dealer's license. And they're like, no, you need a dealer's license and a mortgage license. So they like bring these back to us. And until then... We're gonna put a hold on your bank account. So, oh my god! You bring it back to us, we'll unlock your bank account. And at the time, we were getting like forty grand a month in payments, auto, oh. auto, auto pay, uh, direct deposit. And some of these people that we were selling homes to, we sold them. So a lot of these people work for the cartel, so they have like liaisons that that translate for them, that that do all like the paperwork stuff for them. Mm-hmm. Just, they just they just live there, go work on the farm, go work, <laughs> right. Who knows, they work for the cartel, but. <laughs> Um, so we would, it was hard to get back in touch with these people because they had the a liaison handling all their paperwork for them or like a cousin who was filing all the paperwork for them and getting the titles and getting all the paperwork and putting it in their cousin's name. And then like the cousin would disappear and like do whatever they do with their life. But they were just kind of getting their cousin here and getting all the paperwork set up. So then we were trying to find these people so we could redo the, the contracts because we, we found an MLO. Who would so we had to like redo all of our contracts with the license on there and get them renotarized. It took us 10 months to find all these people because like we would drive out to the house and then nobody would be home because they'd be at work or Woo! like all kinds of stuff, you know. And so it just got really, really uh difficult. It took like there was about 120 grand in the bank account that got froze. And then the 40 grand a month that was coming in for those 10 months that wasn't coming in for 10 months until oh we God. found those people who were like, oh no, you got a director, we got to change your direct deposit and we got to redo your contract and stuff. And it was, it was a mess. Oh my God. So we stopped financing homes. Then when we started selling homes only for cash, they had to be moved because those were the only buyers who had the cash to who, you know, those were the only cash buyers. People who wanted the home moved to their land. They just, sold their house somewhere or they've been saving up money and they bought land or they're buying the home and they're going to pay for it. So we started only just dealing with those buyers uh, because they had 60 to hundred grand cash and we're just mm-hmm. like, they got it. And we're just going to focus with these people. Yeah. So we started doing that. And then, so we started selling these homes with the delivery included. Like, so when we show our price on fight on Facebook, the price would include the delivery <laughs> price and the install price. So it'd be like 20 grand more. Yeah. Cause you were moving them and installing them. Okay. So that price would be included in the sale. So the price would look like it was crazy, but then you tell them, oh, all the stuff's included, it'd be great. But then other people, other investors would go and like, dang, these, these people are selling these houses for 60 grand. Well, we're gonna get our prices up to match. And so people were buying them, seeing that ours would sell, and they'd be like, oh man, these houses are selling so much, but they wouldn't read the fine print. And sooner or later, the market started to match those prices. We had to keep raising prices. Now like double wides that used to be five grand are now 120 grand. Man. So uh, that's how we, after about 200, 250 homes, we started saying, oh man, now we need to buy our own factory because now we can't get mobile homes. Uh, the auction got shut down because so many people were crying that they lost their home and trying to uh, dispute it because they they didn't, they, there's a redemption period of seven days. 
And some people okay. are crying, oh, I want another week. If I just had another week, I'd get my paycheck and I could pay it. And the sheriff just got tired of it. So he's like, we're just going to stop holding the auctions and as long as I'm sheriff. So we're like, man, inventory is getting scarce. We can't buy these at like market values. Is, that's crazy. Even when we are moving them to land and selling them for ourselves and selling them for like 250 to 300 grand, it's still, it gets too close sometimes. It's almost yeah. kind of crazy. So that's where we got into just uh, building our own. Um, and we've been wanting to open our factory now for like um, maybe like three years. Uh, but now we finally we finally got it to where uh, we could get a loan to open up the factory and uh, fill it with some machines and some pre-orders on homes. We started talking to some parks and uh, we told them we'll build them some park models to get started with. And so we got about like uh, 40 pre-orders of park models. Nice. And then we use that to, to as to as like um, our down payment for a loan. A, a construction loan to build the factory and, and tool out the factory and get those first uh first 10 homes built and then as those ones would get built they'd start bringing in money and they'd pay for the other the, the rest to get built oh my goodness mark that i mean that story is like so amazing i mean i know there were so many ebbs and flows like through your whole journey and process but like one thing that i really love is the creativity um that you have uh, in figuring out how to finance things or how to get deals done um, in ways that, you know, are outside of the norm, you know, even with you talking about, um, and now it's kind of sparking the idea in my mind, um, other than the conversation before that sparked another idea. Every time I talk to you, it was like, I'm sparking another idea. <laughs> but, um, you know, but the idea of when one of the first stories you've mentioned was, you you had the buyer pay you um the 1500 or whatever you paid that to the seller and then you financed mm -hmm. the rest mm -hmm. i didn't even think about that as like an option because we have we do have a lot of people that ask obviously you know can we seller finance them we do want to get into um seller financing but um i never thought about it from that perspective of like pay me the down payment so we know we've been it's kind of like a wholesale deal but then you end up actually turning it into a, a longer term scenario where you're getting that cash flow so that right there is just crazy um and amazing and it's a great great strategy and i know one thing that you mentioned um several times on the front end of your story was um this life insurance stuff yeah. and i think that that's something that you know, I really wanted to touch on because I heard you talk about it on one of your interviews with Calvin and I just was like, what? So you mentioned, um, you mentioned, you know, the strategy, uh, it was like perfect timing for us. You mentioned the book. Um, I ordered it literally immediately. <laughs> I read it and it just like totally opened up my brain. And the thing about like, I'm, this is my new book as a gift. Like, yeah this, this book is it you know so um mm -hmm. so i just want you to to, to share a little bit of insight because i i had somebody yeah. on recently um and we talked about purchasing properties with credit but mm -hmm. now a whole nother idea of purchasing all the homes with your life insurance so yeah well, can you, can you go, just to, talk about to, that a bit well bring it back um i finance my entire life sale with life insurance so those who don't know we're talking Love about it this book called becoming your own banker. Yes. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> we are like some f big fans, big fans. Yeah. So this is the infinite banking strategy. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's basically kind of founded by this guy named Nelson Nash. And basically what he figured out was how to use a permanent whole life insurance policy as his own banking system to create his own banking, uh, his own bank, right? Essentially, yeah being able to lend and borrow from himself. So he's essentially using his insurance policies as uh, savings accounts. Instead of going to the bank, he has the insurance policy be as a savings account. It holds all his cash. And essentially from insurance policies, you can lend from your policy. You can lend from the death benefit of your policy. Mm -hmm. Now with, with different between a term policy and a whole life policy is whole life policies have what's called cash value which is basically your policy shares. So every time you make a premium payment, it goes into your cash value, which is the same thing as say your uh, policy shares or your stock shares in the company. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these insurance companies are mutually owned. So however much cash mm -hmm. value you have in your policy, that's how many policy shares you have. That's how many stock shares that you have in the company. 
And those stock shares or that cash value earns dividends off the market, which compound daily. And those dividends are, are what basically fund the death benefit. So mm -hmm. when you pay your premium, a portion of your premium, say you pay $500 a month, you can split it 50-50, 60-40. You can split it however much percentage you want. There's limits. if you, But essentially, you're paying half of it for death benefit, and the other half goes into cash value. You can split that balance up however you want. But if you put too much cash value and, and buy too little death benefit, there's what's called MEC limits, which are um, modern endowment contract uh, limits, which – Basically say, if you overfund this policy, we'll no longer be an insurance policy. We're going to treat this like a, 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 a an investment tool. Right. And we're going to tax this as an investment uh, and, and it will follow SEC regulations because it's no longer, you're not using this for insurance anymore. This is outperforming any insurance uh, investment vehicle in the market, CDs, IRAs, 401ks, all that. So they have limits because if you overfund them, they're just like super investment tools, um, right. which is, which is something like if, if if they say you put too much money into this, it makes it too much of a good of an investment for us to let you have this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so take a note of that. <laughs> right. Take a note of that. Another thing is all the money inside of insurance policy is tax sheltered. It's tax free because it's all considered pre-tax money before it enters the policy. So all the money you put in the policy, all the money you lend out of the policy, all the money that's gained inside the policy from the compounding interest, all of that is tax free. When you take your heirs, when when, you're, when our time expires and they get your life, your death benefit, that money is tax free. Um, so all the money inside of tax policy, uh, uh, inside of whole life policies, are, are tax sheltered. Or it's considered pre-tax before it even touches the policy. Right. Um, so everything that's in the policy and happens after from there is all tax free. Um, so that's another reason why I fund all my deals with policies. And when I was doing seller financing, I had I had the people making payments funding my policies. So when they made the down payment, they opened up the first year, they made the first year's payment for my policy. Mm. Then when they made their other payments, they were paying the 13th month, the 14th month, the 15th month, the 16th month of my policy. I had term writers that say, oh, I can pay my policy further in advance. And then as they made their monthly payments, they were paying my policies. They were funding my policies for me. Now, were they paying it like directly into a policy or they pay you and then you put it into a policy? Yeah, they paid me and I put it into a okay, policy. Okay, okay, okay. But I, but they funded it, right? Right, right. No, tax. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure I knew how to fund everything. Um, so when you take a loan out from a policy, the loan comes from the death benefit. Mm -hmm. So when you get access to that money, that's money that can only be released after you die. I call it Casper cash. It's like you're right. getting a loan from the Casper version of yourself to use today. <laughs> money that would only be made available for your heirs, for your children, for your beneficiaries, mm -hmm. money that you can use today. Yep. And the powerful thing is when you pay back these policies, if you choose to, because you don't have to, it's, it's your loan. If you don't pay it back, then it just comes out of your death benefit. It's yeah. 50 grand less gone, gone to your heir. Right. But if you continue to pay your policies premium every month, it's going to continue building policy shares or stock shares, your cash value. And your cash value is going to grow and grow and earn dividends, which are going to replenish the loan that you took out. Yes, which was like crazy when I read that. I was like, oh, my God. Like, what? Oh, you know, if you pay that loan back, though, that money that you pay the loan back doesn't go into your death benefit account. It goes into your cash value. And the only time you can get money into your cash value is when you're paying your monthly premium, your annual premium. So essentially, by taking loans at your death benefit, using it for investments and then paying it back into the cash value, you're basically speeding up time in the policy because you're putting cash value in there faster. You're growing your shares faster than you naturally can because the only way you naturally can is by paying every month. Right. By taking a loan and pushing it into the policy, now you're taking money and accelerating it into the into the policy sooner, faster. Yes. Say you put an extra 10 grand in there. It would take you four years to pay 10 grand in premiums. Now you can pay 10 grand all in one week mm. and that'd be your cash value. So you're compounding. I mean, you're, you're accelerating your, your rate of compounding. Right. So you're accelerating time. You're speeding up time. Now it doesn't. We might not see the difference, but now when we're talking about trust funds, we got kids. Yeah. And we're able to say if we only paid our premium monthly for our whole lives. After our whole lives, we might have 200 grand in cash value. But say now we use this policy to buy all of our cars, to buy our investments, mm -hmm. cash out, pushing it back in. Now we can have 500 thousand dollars in cash value in there. Something we could have only done if we lived to 400 years old, 300 years old. Right. 
because we wouldn't have been able to live that many months to pay that many premiums. Man. Right? So we're able to accelerate time. And when that goes to our heirs and it's compounding the interest that we earn and growing our death benefit faster and faster and bigger than it would be if we just naturally paid our policy every month. And we create our own banking system and we become the bank and control. You can control the banking function. Exactly. So that was the big thing about this book was creating our own banking functions to control the banking function, control the lending, control the borrowing, control the industry, how, how you repay yourself, you know, how often, how much, and at how much interest. Yeah. So the, yeah. the biggest thing was to really just control the banking function. Yeah. Like you literally are creating, I mean, like your own banking system, like, you know, so I, right. I highly, highly suggest everybody, um, grab a copy of this book, like read it two, three, four times, because it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of information. It's very well explained, but, um, it's something that's completely new. And, you know, one thing that I thought was just so, you know, funny is just like, how life insurance policies, they have been around longer than the banks have been around. So it's just, it's like, this is tried, true, tried and true, you know? So it, it's, you got to get this book if, if nothing else and read it and apply it, um, you know? And I think it's something too that like, and that was my, one of my like things in the beginning is how long um, I thought it was going to take. But then I like from reading the book again, he really shows how it doesn't have to take 40 years for you to be able to kind of build up, um, you know, to the point where you can have this massive amount of, of cash value. Um, so it's amazing. Get the book, get the book. So, so you, you, you have been able to finance your deals, finance your life, um, with your life insurance policies, which is just great. And then, like I said, just offline, you just share with me more about this, um, you know, policies and how we can open, you know, more than one policy, several policies, um, in, in order to kind of build them all at once, which is, is just phenomenal. Um, yeah. And essentially to build more policies, you just open up, like for me, I opened up LLCs for each one of my, um, rentals yeah. it has its own LLC. And then that LLC, since I'm the manager of the, the company, that company opens up in a policy on me. It's not even me opening up a policy. It's the LLC opening up a policy on me because I'm an, an, an interested party for the company. Yes. Yeah. So what's the name? They said, what's the name of the book again? It is uh, Becoming Your Own Banker. Becoming Your Own Banker. By Nelson Nash. By Nelson Nash. Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. Get it. Read it. You see, I got all types. I got all types of notes and everything in this book. <laughs> but uh, but it's really, really good. Um, and another thing that you mentioned, right? And, and this is also uh, something. So Sean is... is going to be getting his MLO license soon. Um, yeah, because it was like, um, again, just talking to you and listening, hearing all of the, these things, we're like, okay, that's the next thing um, is, is getting yep. the, you know, getting the MLO so that we can, when we are doing these seller financing, you know, deals, um, we can do them right and, you know, not have to worry about certain things. So that's just something that's, I mean, would, would you say that, Everybody should get that if they're considering. If your goal is to make a million dollars or 10. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Being a mortgage broker or originator is a multi-million dollar business in itself. Yeah. Once you have your mortgage license, it opens up a whole new world of lending. Um, because now you can buy debt, which are called uh, warehouse lines, where you mm -hmm. buy huge lines of credit at deep discount wholesale low extremely low interest rates and then basically you fractionalize say you buy a 10 million dollar line of credit for 50 grand 80 grand mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you have access to 500 grand or or maybe a million for that yeah. and then you break that up and sell it through a bunch of other uh, smaller loans fifty thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars loans but your interest rate on, on your line of credit maybe one percent and then you can resell portions of his line of credit, you can just start fractioning it off and selling it at now, you know, 6%, 8%. Yeah. And start earning and all that compounding interest off of the same way the banks do everybody else's money. Yep. Yeah. We recently took a course on that very, very, you know, very informative course. Um, I'm going to look, her name is Daphne something. I need to look up um, and I can share it with, with everybody. So you guys can, can take a look at that, but it definitely talked, it went, it went more into um, purchasing um, 
like home own, you know, home mortgages, purchase, purchasing first and second mortgages and things like that. But you're being able to apply that in different, I mean, credit card, I mean, any, anything, you know? So yeah. I think, yeah, that just, that was another thing that just opened up our brain. Like, oh my goodness, you know? So um, somebody said knowledge is power on here. And that's a fact, like, yeah. you, you know, that's, that and it, it really doesn't even got to yeah. be you. I mean, you just got to own the company. You can always yeah. hire somebody, yeah. you know, to do those port. When it comes down to yeah. who's really underwriting all these yeah. mortgages, not you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you just hire somebody for yep. 30 grand a year, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. And that's, a, that's you know what? That's a very important topic. That's something that Sean and I, my husband and I talk about a lot is um, we find that a lot of people struggle with the idea of hiring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like this mentality of like, I can do it all myself or nobody's going to yeah, do it better yeah. or nobody's going to do it better than me, you know, type thing. Yeah. Um, but like that, that is the way, I mean, you, you can't build a Google without having tons of employees. Who's you know? been, raise your hand if you've been to a McDonald's with one employee. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You know, so you have to you have to get to that point, you know, where it's time. It's time to grow. You know, it's, it's time to grow. And there's different there's there's this is something that I think I'm going to probably do like a little video on it because there's different um, there's creative ways that you can build teams. You know, I have for myself when we when we have a um, a sales acquisition now, he's a he's commission me. So it's yeah. not like, you know, he, he's, it, he's great. he loves it, you know, because. Mm -hmm. It works. It actually works out better for him because he's a hustler. <laughs> but like, yeah. um, you know, so you can create different strategies that make sense for you to grow your business. So, yeah. And not, and just because you do it one way with one role or one person doesn't mean that has to be with everybody. Right. I have some people who I pay hourly, oh, weekly, yeah. monthly. Some people yeah. offer commission. Yeah. Um, you know, different different things for different people. Yeah, absolutely. And different roles absolutely. of the businesses. Yes. Yes, I love that. Yeah, that's important. I wanted to just just I know it's a little sidebar, but that's important. So yeah. you're about here buying uh you know properties and financing your whole life with tax uh with um uh life insurance policies, mm -hmm. right? And now we talked about um and this was something that you know really um just captured me in m more so in the mobile homes. I think this is what kind of put me over the edge. Like I was kind of I, I knew it was a, a great investment. I knew that we were gonna do it, but just understanding this is really kind of what just was like, oh, I'm, we're just going all in with this was the idea that you talked about in reference to like land development, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, my mind coming from real property and coming from real estate for, five, you know, almost five years, I was like, you know, OK, I'm dealing with this personal property. You know, do we have the uh, benefits of, you know, tax write offs and things of that nature, which, you know, that's a whole nother um, yeah. thing. But then it's like, well, actually, your mobile home can be converted to real property. You can develop on land, get all of those benefits. And I was like, yep. OK, let's do it. Like, we're going all in. So just talk about us a little bit about um, land development and how great of a freaking option like that, that is, because it's crazy. So I want to give a fun fact. 73% of all the uh, manufactured homes that have ever been built in America have been put on their own land and not in parks mm. in mm. history since the mm. 1970s. Mm. 73%. I need y'all to type in 73. I need y'all to understand 73. That's crazy. Of all the manufactured homes ever built in the history wow. of, of building of manufactured homes. Wow. Are on their own land and not in parks. Man. Yeah. So that's, that's one portion of it too. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, like buying mobile home parks because the cash flow, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which is, that's a thing, right? Um, yep. For me, my goal wasn't cash flow. Mm -hmm. I wanted to build collateralization. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get as much collateral to create as much leverage as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that was real estate. We all know we can refinance property. We can take loans against it. We can get home equity lines of credit. That was my goal. My goal was to build as much business credit as as to get as many lines of credit, to get as much access to leverage as I can. I'm thinking, okay, what's the fastest way to a billion dollars? Mm -hmm. Is it building rental income and trying to get your rental portfolio up to a hundred million a month? <laughs> right. 
and having a bunch of apartment complexes or, you know, getting cheap investments and then turning them into big ones. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started seeing that as soon as we started putting these mobile homes on land, we get anywhere, depending on where, 250, 200 to $400,000 a home. And the best places, $400,000 a home. So three, three double wides, $1.2 million. Mm. Just think of three double wides, just over a million dollars. Wow. So I'm starting to do the math. What's the quickest way to a billion dollars? Do I, and so I started to really think about this because one of the park owners I started working with when I moved homes, he owns over 90,000 mobile home lots. He has, mm. I think, 400 mobile home parks. Wow. Um, Multi billionaire. He probably has about 80 billion. I mean, billionaire, 80 million. Yeah. <laughs> his net worth is about 80 million with 400 mobile home parks and just a, just under 100,000 lots. Mm. You know, and his lots probably all rent at, say, somewhere around six hundred dollars a month. Yeah, somewhere somewhere in that ballpark between you know his four hundred dollar ones and his right thousand dollar ones. Let's say six hundred a month times uh, the ninety thousand. You know, he's making about fifty million a month. Mm -hmm. Um, but with those four hundred parks that he has, each park is probably only worth. At most two, probably his best park, four million. Mm. And he's got 200 homes in that park. Mm. And those 200 homes, they might make them 70 to 80 grand a month. Yeah. But it's all, if he wants to get a loan against that property, he's only going to be able to collateralize like $2 million. Right. Off of that 200 homes. Right. Now, if we were going to put those 200 homes, those same homes on a piece of land, and they were all worth, say, 250 grand. Yeah. Now we're looking at the same five hundred million dollars mm -hmm. um, in collateral. Now, my my strategy is to still rent those homes out. I still yeah. rent those homes, but not for the cash flow. I'm looking for the collateral. How much can I lend against these? I have these rentals. I have these income producing properties. How much can I collateralize against them? Mm. Paying for themselves, I might make like $150 to $250 off each one after they pay their own mortgages, mm -hmm. they pay their own debt down. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it looks better to a bank that I have an asset that's say $250,000 that services its own debt. Yeah. That looks better to the bank than me making a hundred to $250 a month in cash profit because I'm paying down. Right. They, they're, yeah. that, it's going to take a lot of properties, um, you know, to get there. I mean, it took me 83 homes to get to 40 K a month. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so when I started, uh, getting what, these homes, what was that? I'm sorry to cut you off, but what was that? What was that time frame Like, like how, how, about how long did, you, did that kind of take you? 83 to get to 83, uh, mm -hmm. like four months from the beginning. Mm hmm. Oh my God. Oh yeah. You guys were buying it. Yeah. You were buying a bunch at the auction. You y'all were doing. Whew, I love it. Yeah. And in the market, like nobody knew mobile homes at any value. We just hit it at such a sweet time that you could go into a park and buy a brand new, like 2005 home for $2,500. Cause they wouldn't like, there was nobody else there to buy it. Like right. who was going to buy a mobile home? Right. <laughs> in 2014 and 13. Right. Unless they were going to a park to live in a mobile home park. But yeah. like nobody outside of that was, was doing that. So people didn't even know people would buy mobile homes. They would just give them away. They were like, I can't sell this thing even if I wanted to. Right. Um, they just sell it back to the park when they were ready, when they were done. So to know that they could get cash for it and not like have to sell it back to the park, people just liked that part of it. And then, you know, we were financing them. So we were selling them for like 15 grand on payments with five grand down or 10 grand down. Mm -hmm. And then we go buy two more. So it, it, the the cards were a little stacked in our favor at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, was just, it, was just, it was just amazing timing. I couldn't do that again today. Okay. No, no, I, I, yeah. Not not in today's market, especially with the, the, the price of the homes here. It, right. It, that was today, for sure. It, uh, yeah, no. But I mean, there were there was homes that we were getting for eight grand and selling for forty two thousand on payments with like ten thousand dollars down. We're getting money <laughs> back and just the down payment. So we just got really lucky in terms of that. So 
But then it was getting to the point where, okay, we could buy this $25,000 double wide because the prices were getting so high. It's like, how we might be able to sell for 30 or 40, but we, there's no way we can get them cheaper than this. Yeah. We can, we can start to really profit is by putting them on land. As soon as we put them on land, we can get as close to 300,000 as we can. It's like turning a $25,000 double wide and a $50,000 piece of land and then turning it into 300 grand. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we realized that we could refinance them, take the loan. Once we put them together, we could go and get a mortgage on them and then mm. rent them out and then have the rent pay the mortgage. Mm-hmm. So when you, when, you, when, when, when you, it's not a personal mortgage, it's a company's mortgage. Mm. So that's mm. building business credit. So now it's like this business now has a $300,000 asset. We're going to get another mm-hmm. one. Now they got two, three hundred dollars on that. And we get a third one. Now this, this business has a million dollars in assets off of three homes. Mm-hmm. So it's wow. again, from that perspective, instead of the cash flow, uh, now this business has a million dollars in assets. Yeah. That service their own, the, their own debt, essentially. Yep. Oh man. So, I love it. Now, when you, when that, you bring those, I'm sorry, go ahead. So like my goal was to get my business to have $10 million in assets. Mm-hmm. Fifty million dollars yeah. in assets than a hundred million dollars in assets. Mm-hmm. That was more the goal than the cash flow goal because if I have a hundred million dollars in assets, I can collateralize that and get access to one hundred eighty million, yes. two hundred million. Yes, that was the goal. I, that I mean, that right, that really is so important. I don't think you really hear that often. You hear a lot about cash flow, um, but not really a lot about like collateralizing things, like you know, collateral period, because. Um, that's something that just us with even trying to kind of build some things, you know, you have to have like, what, where's the collateral, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, like, where are you going to, how are you going to back this up? You know? So that's, that's really, really, really important that you mentioned that. Um, yeah, that's something that needs to be talked about a bit more. And even just to sure. create leverage, like yeah, almost all my deals, if I, if I didn't use loans, I was, I was partnering with investors who so we were taking policy loans. I have insurance policies and pulling it together. Yeah. Um, or taking uh, other, like they were fixing flippers and just getting and just JVing with them, and they would put in 50 grand, mm-hmm. and I'd put in 50 grand, and we get somebody else put in 20 or 30, and it'd pay for the land, it would pay for the move and the install, it'd pay to put in a septic tank and a well, mm-hmm. and, and to pave a driveway and, and, and to buy a house. It'd pay for all that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, when you, so you, let's just say, you know, you, you get the land for the land development, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're focusing on, Finding the land, um, you buy the land, you get the mobile home. Now you, I, I remember you from what I heard in one of your interviews, like you're buying the the uh, the mobile home or the manufactured home from the manufacturer. You know, bringing that to your land. Once you bring that to the land, once it's installed, is it already real property, or do you still have to go through the process of retiring, uh, surrendering the title? You still have to go through that process. Okay. Okay. But once that's done and it's a fix, now you can refinance it. Okay. Okay. Got you. Got you. Now, one thing I know you were talking about is, and I think this is like super cool is, you know, when you, once you purchase the property from the manufacturer, you in some cases are pre-selling the home before it's even <laughs> on the land. Before yeah. It's even- and that's one of the benefits of having a dealer's license, a manufacturer home dealer's license too, is because you can finance the homes from the factory at like 10%, 10% mm-hmm. down as a dealer and you're getting the dealer discount. Wow. wow. So it's wow, like wow. I buy a hundred twenty thousand dollar home, twenty two hundred square feet, four bed, two bath, with, with for like fifteen k down, and then uh, once I put it on land, it's twenty two hundred square feet, and, and at that point, it's just where do you put it? Are you gonna put it on a piece of land where you get a hundred dollars a square foot? You're gonna put it on a piece of land you get one hundred fifty dollars a square foot? You put it on a piece of land you get two hundred dollars a square foot? Uh, you got 2,200 square feet. So where are you going to maximize it? So <laughs> I'm always thinking of leverage. How can we create the most we the most leverage? Things. Yeah. So like one of the first things I'm thinking about when I, when I look at a piece of land is, is this better to put a new home here or a used home? Mm. And it's basically off like, what's the ARV? What's the after relocation value? What, what What's the price per square foot I can sell this for? Okay. okay. The higher it is, like if it's upwards to 200, then I'm going for a brand new factory home because I can pull out an FHA loan on it, or it's mm. going to be need to get a loan against it. Like if I can get somewhere two hundred dollars a square foot, I'm getting a two thousand square foot home because it's almost a half a million dollar double wide. Mm. So I'm going to get a brand new one so I can get a loan against it. I can get a half a million dollar loan on it yes. without even worrying about it. But oh, if I find, you know, a really cheap 
used home for like a couple thousand dollars, then I'm just going to find a piece of land where I can put it on and get maybe not the highest dollar, but maybe a hundred, right. $125 a square foot. Um, and somewhere I can get land really, really cheap. Or even if I can finance the land from the owner with, you know, five grand down, no payments for six months. Yes. And something like that. Yes. Oh my goodness. Guys. You I know, know that this month. group is a uh, mobile home investing for newbies <laughs> and these are some high, you know, high level, um, you know, strategies. Not really. I don't want to make it sound like it's, you know, not attainable and not, you know, easily um, can be achieved for sure. Um, but I just had to, I mean, we had to have Mark on. If you, again, if you didn't know him before, um, now you do. And now you see why so many people refer to him as the GOAT because <laughs> it's just like, this information is crazy. These strategies are crazy. Um, and just like your application of them. And, and I think even the way you explain them, it's very, very easy to understand and to apply. Um, so I just love it. I love it. I love it. I, every, every time you're on, I'm like, okay, let me, uh, let me tune in real quick <laughs> because I'm going to learn something. And that's specifically what I said, uh, on, on the post is look, you're going to learn something tonight. Your mind is going to expand tonight yeah. for sure. Um, and my mind has expanded and I've already heard you multiple times. Every time I hear you, my mind expands. So, um, yeah, this, this is just so, so good. Now, one thing. I want to want to uh, obviously you know wrap up with is um, well two things real quick one because um, I know you were I know you were a mover um, mm -hmm. so did that did that help your business by being able to I know it's I know we mm -hmm. had that conversation and you like don't do it <laughs> yeah um, specifically you know but did you feel it was helpful being able to have it's kind of a question 22. I think the only reason I was able to do it because I did it personally myself. Okay. If I were to like hire a crew and do that, it, it probably would have been a lot harder. I was my own mechanic. Uh, I was the driver. Uh, you okay. know, I had to learn all, all this stuff in order to kind of uh, get it to where I could train people. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, what it definitely did help me with was sell the homes. A lot of times... I probably wouldn't have been able to sell those homes if I couldn't include the delivery. Mm, okay. So that was like, that was like the the icing on the cake for uh, my marketing. Okay. Like being able to, to, to deliver and install the home. That was what changed uh, everything in terms of like the wholesale side, because I'd be mm. wholesaling the houses essentially but then, you know, moving and installing the homes and that'd be another, you know, um, uh, money source, not much. Yeah. Um, uh, cause it costs a lot of money. You got to have a good crew and good equipment and all this other stuff. It, it almost really just pays to get it sold, um, mm. uh, fast. Yeah. Um, knowing that, you know, your buyer has the confidence they see your truck right there that is going to get delivered and installed. Right, um, right, right, right. That right. was that was a big uh, game changer. Now, you know, was it? It only worked for that market of people who wanted those homes. Mm. At the same time, Jane Samara Harvey, also mm -hmm. Nick's, also some of my best friends and business partners. That yes. my first like two dozen homes we partnered on. Mm. Oh, nice, nice. Yes. Yeah. So we got started together. That that meetup that I went to, they were yes. there. Yes. And, and, oh and wow, people. wow. Yeah, I tell everybody, I won. I won their course. Like they had like a freebie on YouTube, and they're like, you know, share this on your Facebook. I was like, share. You yeah. know, sent them the email. I sent it. Um, I won their course. I was so like, so that really helped me into this. You know, getting into this space. I love them. I reached out to Samara with hoping to get her on her and um uh what what's her husband's name again? Jeremy J. 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 Yes, J. I'm we're hoping to get um them on as well soon. So give them a yeah, call. They, uh, they, they're, they're coming over my house this weekend. We're gonna hang out with the oh, kids. Oh, nice, so, nice. I'll, yes. I'll, I'll, so trailer, I'll, I'll trailer I'll cash academy, trailer cash academy. I love it. Yeah. Yes, they're they're exactly. some of my best friends. So yeah, um, you know, and they always had their business, and their business was just seller financing. Right. Um, they didn't really do much remodeling. Um, 
they basically just found homes that were clean and they'd make them a little bit cleaner just clean them out you know uh maybe maybe carpet paint at most yeah uh but then just finance them they got an mlo samara used to be a cpa um, oh nice and one of her uh people that she worked with had their mlo so then she just reached back to her old co-worker and then was like hey do you want to make some money on the side type of thing and her co-worker was like yeah cool why not and then ended up working for them full time and leaving their job and coming to work with them. Oh wow. And so they were just financing homes. That was their that was their, you know, uh that was their niche. In the yeah. Market. And then there's Brandon Plant Steel, who's um people may or may not know. I mobile, never heard of him. Mobile home guys. Um yeah, Oh yeah, of, yeah. Okay, okay. I didn't I didn't know his name, but yes. He's out here too. All three of us started together under the same mentor at the same same day. Nice. And so uh you know, his business model was rehabbing. He actually would, he started as Shemen Van Gundy's like um, capital raiser. He okay. did a lot of capital raise, raising for other real estate companies. Yeah. Um, through securities, through like accredited investors. So he would raise money from accredited investors and, you know, help them make 15% of their money annually. Love so it. he he had his own fund. So basically he was, just, he had his own hedge fund um, oh, and nice. he used that hedge fund to rehab and fix mobile homes and that's how he made his little you know uh corner in the market yes. so even though we're all here in phoenix um we all kind of found our own our own lane yeah 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 phoenix just yeah it's like something about phoenix i don't know what it is like even when it's i was phoenix. wholesaling even though i was wholesaling houses it was like everybody was in phoenix like all yeah. the big players were like in phoenix i don't know what it was that's why i moved here in like 2014, <laughs> Robert Kiyosaki's from out here. Yeah. Cody Sperber from Clever Investors out here. Dean Graziosi, um, yes, like uh, Tony Robbins' best friend, he's out here. Yes, yes. Um, there's wow. so many, so many. So that's wow. that's one of the reasons why I came out here. I was Absolutely. like, hey, I want to get into this real estate thing after right. college, and the whole architecture thing didn't work out. I wanted to get mm -hmm. into wholesaling and the MLM thing. I couldn't find a mentor, so I was like, I'm just gonna move to Arizona. I lived in my car for the first six months. Wow. Um, until I uh, got a loft, I got an apartment, and uh, yeah, I was just determined. I was like, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna come to Arizona and figure it out." So I love it. I absolutely love it. And now you I mean all from all the way there to now owning and uh, manufacturing your mobile homes. Like, yeah. so we we can't we can't like we have to um, end this with just congratulating you. That is such a huge accomplishment. Um, and I mean, that's really beautiful. When I got the video, I was like, oh my God, like I was so excited. I was like, Sean, Sean, you know, you know so, we were talking about it too. Yeah. Yeah. He's super pretty. Like, he's like, all right, we about to, we about to, uh, catch a flight. So he's like, you ready to, re let, let's go, you know, so we, we ready to come out there and visit you and just take nice. a look at your, your, you know, your, your, um, factory yeah, and, you know, just, yeah. just build more as we, as we have been. But, um, but yeah, just I mean, congratulations on that. Uh, how how does that feel now? You know, manufacturing mobile homes. I feel like I'm just getting started in the business. Like now, wow. <laughs> like I'm finally getting started now. Like everything before was like uh, uh, a training. Like I was yeah. still I was still reading the owner manual. It's like okay, <laughs> I finally done reading the owner's manual. Now I can try putting this thing together. Oh my god, that's goodness. what it feels like. Oh my goodness. So, so, like so owning, you know, owning 83 in four months, that was just, that was just the, the, the manual. Now it's like the real stuff begins, huh? Yeah. That's what it feels like. Wow. That's so big. I mean, we, 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 you know, really just want to congratulate you and just, that's just amazing, 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 you know, in you. any way that we can um, push you and just, you know, make you become the number one manufacturer. Like that is just, Amazing, amazing, amazing. So um where where can people find you? You know, if they want to connect with you or just follow you, where where would you like people to yeah? I mean on Facebook, you can follow me at, um just Mark Anthony, you can find me there. Twitter, I just got into Twitter again. Uh <laughs> NFT Mark Anthony. Um I'm trying to get big in the NFT and metaverse space. One of the yes. things we're gonna be doing with our homes is uh being issuing the titles as NFTs using yeah, the smart yeah. contracts. Yes. Uh, using the smart contracts as our titles. Uh, oh, yes. oh, so we're really oh, trying to get into that space. So you can, oh. you can meet us in the metaverse for sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love everything about it. Um, well, again, Mark, thank you so much for your time. 
um, and just coming and shedding light and just information and knowledge onto all of us um, here. We really, really appreciate everything that you do. You just are so awesome um, and just sharing so much information on, uh, you know, here and everywhere you are. Um, so just keep being great and we just appreciate you and um, everybody. Peace out. Well, we I want to I want to just uh, read like two of the comments. Mark, thank you for dropping the jewels. Jasmine, thank you, uh, Queen. We also we always eat when we come to the din to your dinner table. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we I appreciate that. Got someone else. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Mark. And congratulations. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you both for this amazing live. We got somebody in here, TCA crew. Oh, let's no, go, no, Trevor yeah. Cash Academy. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. I love it. Thank you, Mark. I always search you out for the great gems you drop. That's a fact. Like always, wherever he's at, make sure you you tune in because you're gonna make learn sure something. If you guys want a copy? I have a PDF version of this book. Oh, nice. If you message me, I'll, I'll send you over the PDF and the password for it. you. Need like a little password to unlock it. But if you guys can't get your, I know on Amazon they were like four hundred dollars i was like what? i know i know it was crazy we ended up finding like a little off branch website and we got it for forty dollars but then it yeah. was like it's out it was like out but the same thing i actually sent uh, i don't know where sean even found a pdf but he found one somewhere too and sent it over to our, our team but but message message mark if you want a copy that of that pdf because this book is amazing yeah amazing. it changes you want to build generational wealth that is the yes. single-handedly the only key and the only tool for real generational yes. wealth. I totally Hands agree. down. There, totally, there's, nothing, totally. there's nothing else on the planet that can compare other than Bitcoin. Facts. And we on that too. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much, Mark. We appreciate it. Everybody, you guys have a great night. And um, we'll be back next week. Talk to you all soon. Have a good all one. Right.